Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. Just recently I was asked by an organizer of a conference in Budapest to provide a lecture on future relations with Russia and the Ukraine. Um, I would like to share today my thoughts on that also in my YouTube channel. Elaborating on relations between Europe and Russia and Ukraine, we need to define at the very beginning that a relationship, uh, like in case of relationship between human beings, is always defined by both sides. Um, in terms of Ukraine, we know better in which shape the country is, uh, in which processes it will be going through uh, after the war than in the Russian case. Um, Ukraine has been already for several years an associate member of the uh, European Union. That means it signed an association agreement, including deep uh, comprehensive free trade area, so we have an, um, data and information about the uh, uh, stage of its um, um, administrative system and also economy. Um, I personally was three years responsible for Eastern Partnership, for the first thematic platform of the Eastern Partnership. So we know something about the stage of reform, reforms. Uh, we know that how much was done uh, in adjusting uh, its legal system, adopting uh, legal tools to combat corruption and so on and so forth. Um, of course, it is nowadays uh, very difficult to assess the level of damages uh, uh, caused by the war, but it is something also that you can uh, somehow master. And um, first and foremost, uh, Ukraine after the war will be part of EU accession process. Um, sooner or later it will start uh, uh, negotiations so we will have a uh, kind of leverage also on Ukraine, on, on Ukrainian reforms and uh, it will be also um, striving for its membership in, in NATO. In case of Russia uh, it's much more difficult because it's very hard to assess what kind of impact the result of the war will have on, on Russia. And uh, we also do not have so much information about the real stage of the, of the, of the Russian state and of its economy. Um, let uh, us be clear there are different kind of scenarios uh, uh, possible. We do not know who will come after Putin, who, in my understanding, will not survive uh, this war. Let's say not survive in its uh, in its position, and it's my firm belief that Russia is going to lose this war. Sooner or later, it will lose. Um, then there might be some internal fighting inside. Um, power structures among Silovikis and different kind of circles, also maybe some oligarchs, who knows. But uh, let's not forget that there is quite also a powerful um, uh, movement of people who were even before ready to uh, challenge the system. So I cannot even exclude that those people, let's say Navalny, Navalny circles if he survives, uh, uh, will come to power. We do not know. I do not expect any a disintegration of the state. I do not uh, expect that uh, uh, Russia as a state will uh, disintegrate. I rather uh, expect um, continuation and maybe strengthening of the tendency that, will, that uh, was there in Russia even before the war. That means uh, uh, different regions of Russia striving for more autonomy, more independence on Moscow, maybe push for a, a proper federalization of the state that Russia, that Moscow will not be deciding everything. This is what, what we can expect, but we do not know. But that's for sure, what's for sure, that uh, we will not have a leverage 
the West will not have a leverage on the development in Russia. Russians themselves and then the system themselves will uh, will define the, f uh, um, uh, the future and the fortune of the of the of the country. So, having said that, that we have some limited information on Ukraine uh, because it's still ongoing process and uh, a very limited information uh, on Russia and and very limited leverage. We can concentrate on, let's say the the first part of the axis, the European Union. As I said at the beginning, relations between European Union and external action, uh, actors is defined by both sides, the quality of the relationship. So in which um, stage is now a European Union as a global player? Because uh, it has been uh, for many years very uh, clearly defined and outspoken uh, ambition of the European Union and its representatives that European Union will be a, a global player. Um, global player that will also have an influence uh, uh, and leverage on, on external war, including Russia and, and Ukraine. What kind of lessons uh, we have from the war in terms of European Union ability uh, to become a global player. Let me uh, say at the very beginning that uh, I'm policy planner. Uh, I spent 19 years as a, uh, in, in diplomatic service, half of this time as a policy planner. And from policy planning point of view, to prepare some policy or change of policy, you need to rather focus on weaknesses of the system, on the failures of the system in order to prepare some adjustment, not on its achievements. So um, I will uh, take this lecture that I'm still kind of you know policy planner, but I'm freelancer and I'm, I'm free to, to criticize and, and point uh, to, to different uh, failures and weaknesses. Um, if European Union wants to be a, a global power, it needs to uh, use effectively its strategic assets. What is the major strategic asset of the European Union? This is um, certainly its economic power. European Union being uh, among the major European economies, second place, third place, it depends. Um, so uh, you can use your economic strength in a different manner. Um, you can use it as a seductive power or seduction of your partners. It means, for instance, that uh, membership of the European Union is a big motivation for countries who are aspiring for becoming a member to adjust their legal system, their economy, um, their societal uh, resilience. I know personally from our experience, from Czech experience, uh, how strong this uh, seduction was, this seductive power for us to adjust, to adjust legal system, to prepare for um, having, uh, uh, having uh, introducing uh, a key monitor, uh, how strong we were motivated later on also to become uh, a part of the Schengen area, how strong motivation for us it was to take part uh, as a full-fledged members in the internal market of, of the European Union. So um, I can say that European Union knows very good and, and know very well how to use its uh, seductive power. And I expect that it will be uh, applied also in case of the Ukraine. Ukraine will continue with adjustment of its legal and economic system and political system because there will be a strong motivation. 
future membership and, and share in uh, uh, free movement, uh, people, labor, capital and, and, and internal market. But sometimes uh, you need to use uh, your economic strength uh, for coercion. You need to use um, your strength for coercive policy. And I think the picture here is very much different from the first, from the seductive uh, policy of the European Union. Um, it leads me to the topic of sanctions and the application of sanctions uh, in case of Russia uh, against Russia for its uh, aggression again against Ukraine. I have to say very clearly, and I said it also before that, I published also articles about this, uh, that it is rather failure. It is failure of sanctions as a coercive policy. In my understanding, uh, sanctions are not defensive policy, it is not punitive policy, but it is coercive policy. And effectiveness of this coercive policy, effectiveness of sanctions, you need to measure against the fact to what scale, what level it coerces your adversary to change its behavior. I need to say very clearly that sanctions did not change the Russian behavior. And the European Union uh, was expecting at the beginning the contrary. So uh, why did it fail? Why it failed? Um, because it was uh, first the process was wrong and, and slow, and second, European Union does not have a robust institutions in implementation uh, sanctions. What I mean by that? Uh, it was prepared uh, too late uh, because, uh, in my understanding, the first uh, sanction package uh, should have been prepared in the spring 2021. Spring 2021, when Russia was um, deploying its forces around Ukraine. If you recall, it took one year. Technically, Russia could have done it within three three months, two, three months, but it took them one year and they observed us, they observed the reaction, they observed that there was no like, sanction package. European Commission sh uh, at that time should have been tasked by European Council to prepare a, a strong sanction package with clear trigger mechanism and trigger mechanism as the invasion of, of Russia to Ukraine. So if there is no invasion, no Russian booth on the ground, no package uh, would be initiated. But it should have been already prepared. Um, European Union uh, started to prepare uh, sanctions um, on the eve uh, of, uh, Europe of Russian aggression, and it was too late. And not only it was too late, but uh, the process uh, had some really weak points. Um, I remember that the first sanction package was a couple of days before before the aggression, it was basically uh, individual sanctions, economic sanctions and, and, and visa sanctions, basically against individual uh, individuals and maybe some companies. The second package that already included some tangible sectoral and, and banking sanctions was prepared just day or a couple of days before the aggression and and it was kept behind the closed door by respective directorate of the European Commission. It was closed behind the closed door, not even uh, member states were including in this process of preparing the sanctions. There were uh, only uh, uh, they were informed partially and uh, uh, but uh, they did not know, member states, what exactly is in the second package of the European sanctions. And not only that, member states did not know uh, exactly 
uh, the adversary did not know. So how can you coerce an adversary if the adversary, I mean Russia, does not know what sanctions it is facing? So that's clearly uh, uh, misunderstood uh, meaning of sanctions as a coercive tool. And then it was uh, the pace of preparing next and next packages was very slow. It targeted uh, uh, some sectors um, and the process was so slow that Russia could adapt because Russian financial and banking system proved quite uh, proved to be quite resilient one. In this war, if something failed, it was a Russian uh, security system, army security services, and, and, and you know, it's Siloviki circles. But banking system and, and uh, financial system proved to be resilient, and it prepared for the slow pace of the sanctions. And then uh, there were clearly some limitations of the sanctions. If you recall, uh, uh, you know, buzzword, SWIFT. We will cut Russian uh, bank from SWIFT system. What does that mean? This is not full blocking sanctions against the Russian banks. Russian banks can um, easily survive with this. It, it means that financial uh, operations need to be uh, confirmed by the old system, fax, uh, basically, and, and not, not using this SWIFT system. But it does not block uh, the activity of the, of the Russian uh, banks. Um, sanctions uh, did not include agriculture, agriculture products. How can effect of the sanctions can be, uh, be felt by the Russian inhabitants, by the Russian population, if it's not uh, about the food? Uh, simple as that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, theory that we should not leave Russian population suffer is flawed. It's other way around. We, we need to feel Russian population suffer in order to increase pressure of this Russian population to its own system to, to stop the aggression. But maybe it was also connected with very powerful agricultural lobby because I know before in uh, earlier it was always difficult uh, case you know to, to touch up on uh, let's say uh, uh, money of um, European uh, farmers uh, uh, and the problem is also a, a huge circumvention of sanctions. Huge circumvention by European companies. The European sanctions are not circumvented by the third uh, countries. Third countries are only interlocutors for providing a European production to Russia. Every day there is hundreds of trucks going between Latvia and, and Russia. These are not Latvian companies, European companies. A uh, couple of European companies are increasing substantially their export to Kazakhstan. Why? Because this is going down uh, to Russia. And the European Union does not have any legal system, any legal tool, any judiciary system that would enable to go after European sanctions uh, that uh, are breaching uh, uh, the sanction policy. This is the difference between the European Union and the United States. In the United States, uh, every court in every uh, uh, American country, in North Carolina or Alabama, can even just destroy um, economic giants for not complying with sanctions. This is not the case uh, uh, in, in Europe. The European Union does not have any legal system to go after European uh, uh, companies circumventing of uh, sanctions. What is the result of it? Look at Russian economy now. Um, OECD, World Bank, and uh, other uh, financial institutions are predicting GDP growth. 
for this year, Russia will be among a few countries from G20 that have GDP growth this year. And it will have a even modest, but still GDP growth in next year. This is the result of the sanctions. This is really the uh, uh, result of declared economic war between European Union and Russia. Um, I believed, and it was my mistake, I believed too much to predictions in spring 2022, predictions of economists, of, of different economic agencies, that Russia's economy start to collapse beginning of autumn 2022. There were some even predictions that the Russian GDP will fall about 25%. If this was the case, the war would be over by now. And it's clear. Look at the history. Look at First World War, for instance. Military-wise, German army was not in bad shape in, in 1918. It was on offensive moves in the spring, summer, 1918. But the le German leadership knew that the country is exhausted in terms of personal and economic way. So it was coerced, it was forced to sign and, and uh, tooth with allies. If we were able to bring Russia to such economic situation in 2022, the war would have been over by now. It was not the case. We saw not we see not only a GDP growth, we we see a, a production a capacity of Russia growing, production capacity in uh, mining, in constructing, in, in manufacturing are rising. Uh, the revenues from from gas and oil uh, start to grow again. Uh, Russian companies who are facing the, the, the sanctions, sectoral sanctions, are reorienting their production to meet the domestic demands. And if they have money, if they have state subsidy for, for it, state uh, grants and loans and, and, and programs, um, they are fine with this because uh, uh, they are producing for the domestic demand. I know it is war economy and uh, in the longer term this is not uh, sustainable. You know, there will be many vulnerabilities in the, in the Russian economy. But nowadays pensions are rising, pensions are rising, uh, Russia is able to pay the salary for, for soldiers and attracting new soldiers to the, to the battlefield. This is the result of the European uh, economic coercion policy. Clearly failure. So in, uh, um, in future, if European Union wants to be really a, a player on the global scene, it needs to improve the system. It needs to improve the system of adopting and maybe withdrawing also sanctions. You need to have more flexibility, but at least it need to have also some system, uh, some legal system that would go after European companies that are breaching uh, 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 sanction uh, policy. Or it should resign from uh, uh, sanctions as a coercive policy. Fine. At the beginning, if there was an understanding on the, on the European side that, that we will not apply European sanctions, we will put all efforts in, in a military solution, providing military aid to Ukraine and, and forgetting about sanctions, it will be fine. But once European Union introduced uh, economic sanctions and they did not bring this result, it means a failure. So, and this is a, a, a lesson uh, for European Union uh, after this war uh, that needs to be uh, really deeply uh, elaborated on. Um, in terms of um, security or security domain, uh, the picture is uh, not that bad, it's quite as positive, taken into account that European Union primary goal is not to be provide uh, to, to provide let's say security to provide hard security because there are other providers of, of the security like NATO and the United States but I mean in this domain 
uh, European uh, Union results it's, uh, are not that uh, negative, uh, meaning first and foremost uh, that the European uh, Union was able to generate 5.6, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 6 billion of euros from European peace facility for military aid to uh, Ukraine. I would not expect this before the war that from European peace facility that was rather uh, devoted to, let's say, some programs in, in Africa, we would be able to provide the military aid. And nowadays there is a plan to increase European peace facility up to uh, 20 billion of euros. So I, I think it's quite uh, a good result that uh, uh, there was a common ground that enabled to increase European peace facility and then make it really functional. Um, I think if in the future European Union and will skip this unnecessary dichotomy between having on one side European Army, European Defense uh, Union or, or major uh, capabilities investments and on the other side to do nothing and to do leave all the uh, security domain exclusively to NATO, uh, it could be very uh, uh, helpful. I think there, sh there should not be such a dichotomy, but uh, we should rather, European Union should rather concentrate on complementarity, complementarity of its effort in security domain with other security providers of NATO and, and EU. What I mean by that? I think that European Union should continue with a successful uh, mechanisms uh, within a so-called CSDP, Common Security and Defense Policy, which is basically about uh, peace uh, uh, keeping, but also peace enforcing and post-conflict uh, uh, resolution. There are nowadays uh, uh, 10 civilian and 6, uh, uh, maybe more, uh, military missions within the Common Security and Defence Policy, CSDP missions of the European Union deployed in North Africa, Balkan and even Middle East. And I think uh, European Union has some unique tools to combine those missions, you know, basically police missions or military missions, gendarmerie missions, with its development uh, uh, tools and uh, some security, uh, security system reforms uh, process and that kind of stuff. So which is a unique system that is about spreading basically uh, uh, stability around Europe, which contributes, uh, in my understanding, to uh, a collective kind of collective security for European Union. So European Union should not dream about having a European army or to invest too much in, in capabilities that are exclusively for the purposes of collective defense, but it should focus uh, on capabilities that are needed for effective uh, work of those uh, missions, CSDP mission, missions, civilian missions, police missions, uh, military missions. And it should somehow improve also mainly uh, planning and uh, uh, commanding uh, capabilities of the European Union. So European Union should have a full-fledged uh, uh, planning and, and command headquarters of those missions. We have now, uh, for civilian missions, we have a planning and command uh, capacity for military missions not so we should improve this, have a European headquarters, civilian, military for planning, as well as command uh, of, of those missions. And we should take this as a, let's say, division of roles between the European Union, in the domain of stabilization around uh, uh, European Union, and the NATO providing really hard security, which basically as it is, it is destructive uh, uh, capability of the army, right? The main task of the army is destruction, destruction of the enemy. And it should be exclusively in, in NATO. And so if we uh, will, will, will be successful to strive with this complementarity between the, let's say, 
you more soft security tools and the hard uh, uh, tools of NATO, it will be, I think, uh, there's a good chance uh, that the European Union will be a, a really uh, a diff, uh, important uh, security player. Um, then I think another lesson of this war is that we need to strengthen um, our expertise, our reading of our adversary, our intelligence intelligence gathering and also uh, collecting intelligence and on also assessment of that. And we need to have a civilian military uh, synergy in um, intelligence, in expert domain, in order to be able to establish the intention of the adversary. This is very important. And this was, I think, one of the most striking phenomenon, at least for me, that during this one year military buildup, Russian military buildup of around Ukraine, the West was not able to establish what is what is the intention. We know that there would be some military attack, but we did we were not able to uh, really. Um, expect what kind of shape, whether it will be this really full-fledged war. Even during this uh, military build-up, even at the head of uh, US uh, military intelligence in a uh, congressional hearing declared, I do not know. I do not know exactly what is the intention. And I think this needs to be changed. We need to strengthen, let's say, and have a synergy between civilian experts politologists, sociologists, economists, and uh, military intelligence or military experts. Because of war is a, a political issue. It is not military war. If I hear so many soldiers, including our chief of general staff, that we should prepare for the next war, I, I think it is flawed. Because uh, uh, next war, if there would be a war, would not be initiated just by military capability of any adversary. So demographic issues, environmental issues, societal issues, uh, social issues, uh, interethnic tensions can be triggered of a war. So we need to have an overall assessment. And uh, that will um, increase our ability to read really the intentions of any other adversary in the future. I'm saying this because uh, it will be also very important in, in case of China. Because uh, what we uh, see now, we see clearly increase of the military capabilities. We can assess it. We have enough data for it. Uh, we uh, can read also some um, scenario of their military drills, but it does not mean that we are able to read their intention and we will be able uh, to establish in time of in, in times of you know increased tension the real intention of China. Uh, and Russia and, and China, they have some military uh, uh, cooperation, but the thinking is, is different. And, and China is also taking a lesson uh, from this war. So, uh, in order to say it bluntly, I think if we will just observe increase of the military power, and if we in some case will I mean, as West, believe too much that they are going to attack, attack, attack Taiwan, it will increase pressure on our leadership to have some political, economic concessions in order to omit war, because war is very costly. I'm not saying that we should not prepare, uh, we need to be prepared and most uh, foremost uh, United States need to invest heavily 
in their military capabilities, we need to uh, help the United States uh, with, let's say, our own protection. The European Union should be uh, um, more capable to protect itself in order to, uh, you know, leave U.S. hands unbound in, in different uh, part of the of the world, including in the Pacific uh, region. But at the same time, we need to be uh, able to establish what is the what might be the really uh, intention uh, of China, because uh, it seems to me now what I observe that the aim of China is rather to coerce Taiwan, coerce Taiwan and change it in its, its policy, and the blackmail of the West. So they have different kind of means uh, uh, apart from attacking militarily Taiwan, which would be very difficult uh, uh, operation. The last successful amphibious operation of this scale was Normandy in 1944. So it would be very difficult, but they have different uh, uh, options, let's say different level of blockades. Uh, I have one my, my uh, uh, video on my uh, YouTube channel of, on different possibilities to have a blockade vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I will show it on the screen at the end. Uh, they have different options to increase their assertiveness in Southern uh, China Sea. They might even choose to uh, attack Philippines, for instance. So we need to be concentrated on the military capabilities, but also on the stage of their society, uh, environment, in order to, and then thinking, in order to establish whether it is a serious or it is an uh, attempt to blackmail us uh, and enforce some uh, concessions. So, European Union needs to strengthen uh, civilian military synergy in expertise and, and intelligence, uh, uh, um, gathering intelligence and also uh, assessment of that. Uh, this is one of the lessons uh, of this war. And uh, last, I think, um, this is something that I observed uh, uh, already before the war, and I think it, it remains the same now as that there is quite um, substantial uh, strategic and, and, and doctrinal gap between the United States and the European Union. Strategic thinking. If you look at the major uh, US strategic documents, being a, a national security strategy, national uh, defense strategy, nuclear postural review, and if, if, you, if you look at the doctrine and thinking, it's different from the European still. Uh, so, uh, United States is speaking op openly um, to make it short about uh, peace through strength. Peace through strength means <laughs> effective sanctions policy, robust uh, military capabilities, using also military cooperation with partners as a political tool, sometimes also coercive tool. Uh, look, for instance, how they were able, able to uh, somehow influence uh, Egypt, for instance. And uh, they are, uh, uh, you know, they take uh, the military power, uh, the, the global uh, uh, military posture as a legitimate tool for of their uh, uh, foreign policy, whereas the European uh, Union and European states, it's it's um, still I think uh, different. Uh, so, the famous uh, thesis that uh, Americans are from Mars and and, and uh, Europeans from Venus is uh, still valid, and I think we sh I, I do not call for adjusting all, let's say, uh, European values, attitude uh, to policy to, to American one, but we need to have a more, let's say, strategic uh, dialogue and trying to adjust our strategic and doctrinal thinking, because otherwise we will face frictions in different um, uh, agendas, also in the future, being uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Middle East, you know, how to tackle Iran, for instance. Uh, so th this is also Another lesson from this war that the gap in strategic thinking of the United States and Europe did not diminish 
and we need to try to overcome uh, uh, this gap. So, uh, to sum up, uh, speaking about our future relations with Ukraine and Russia or any other partners or adversary alike, we need to concentrate now, now on us, on our achievements during this war, but uh, on our failures uh, and weaknesses of the system alike. It is uh, equally important. Concentrate on achievements, concentrate on our failures. There are many.